Good evening. I'm so glad that you are able to join me this evening. Uh, I miss your being here in person, but I'm so happy and thankful that we have the means and the technology to still gather. Uh, although we're far apart, uh, we are still together in worshiping the Lord. Tonight we're going to look at two major world religions, Hinduism and Buddhism. They are different, but they are related, and we're going to look into the reasons why for that. Before we do that, let's have prayer. Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. We thank you that we're able to be together, although apart, and so we ask your blessing upon this time. Be with our church family and our, uh, our families and our friends. Protect us, keep us safe and healthy, and we will give all the glory to God. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. As I mentioned, we're going to look at Hinduism and Buddhism today. Uh, the more I am looking into these world religions, the more I study and learn about them, the more grateful I become that I was born here and someone shared the truth of the gospel with me. I see these people who are struggling to find salvation, and I'm so happy that Jesus died and rose again and that my salvation was provided by his grace so our goal then is to learn how to share the gospel with those who have not yet learned the truth. Hinduism originated actually in Europe probably three to 4,000 years ago by a people group who eventually migrated to India. And so today, 90 to 95% of the Hindus actually live in India. Going back that far, to put it in a perspective that is more familiar to us, that is going back to somewhere during Old Testament times to us, somewhere between the days of Abraham and the days of David, this religion was founded. Because it has no specific founder, no real date, it's difficult to trace its origin and its real history. It is not a single organized religion, but rather a family of traditions and philosophies, many of which are quite different from each other. Many of its people refer to it as the eternal way, just because the beginning goes back into the mists of history and there's not a definite founder or date. Hinduism is the world's third largest religion coming after Christianity and Islam. It has about a billion adherents. Christian tradition has it. Now, this is not scripture. This is not in the Bible. But Christian history has it that the apostle Thomas, who you will remember as doubting Thomas, he had to put his hand in the side of the Lord to actually personally witness his wounds, put his fingers in the nail prints in the Lord's hands to know that it was truly his risen Lord. You remember Thomas. Well, Christian history has it that Thomas was martyred in India in AD 72. So we don't know if that's really fact or not, but it has long been believed that that was the case. And so that would have been about 40 years after Jesus died, uh, two years after the Romans destroyed the temple in Jerusalem, and even before the Apostle John had written the book of Revelation. Hinduism has a wide range of beliefs and practices. There are denominations within it, very diverse, different, varying groups, and so the differences between them sometimes can be extreme. So what we say here today is very general. There may be a friend of yours who is Hindu, and he may say, well, that's not exactly how I believe it, because their differences are great. There are millions of gods in Hinduism. While they retain their old gods, they also are happy to add new ones, and some have estimated that there are upwards of 33 million gods. However, there is one all-pervasive supreme being whose name is Brahman. Brahman is more of an it than a he or she. It's not really a being. It is the cosmic soul, the cosmic energy a great force, the universe. And the very word Brahman comes from a Sanskrit root word, meaning the absolute being, without form, without attributes, 
unknowable, totally impersonal, and unknowable force, uh, ultimate reality, pure intelligence. And so there isn't really a being that is a god. It is more this cosmic energy, this cosmic force. And they believe that the other gods, those other millions, are, tr are kind of just a part of the supreme Brahman. And so they worship these smaller, more diminutive gods in order to better know Brahman. They have a trinity, a triune godhead. Uh, the name of the head of this trinity is Brahma, which is different from Brahman with an N on the end. Brahman with an N is the supreme cosmic force. Brahma is a god who they believe is the creator, the god of wisdom. The second one is Vishnu, the preserver and controller of human destiny, the protector of the world, the restorer of moral order. The third god in their trinity is Shiva. Shiva is a destroyer, a destructive god. Shiva has a third eye. And when this third eye opens, um, there is untamed destructive energy. Everything that's land becomes water. Everything that's water becomes land. And they believe that this power of destruction is used actually to destroy imperfections and create the opportunity, pave the way for recreation or beneficial change. All of the other gods in Hinduism are personified personifications, or what they call avatars, uh, incarnations of the supreme cosmic force, the supreme cosmic energy, Brahman. All living beings in the world are expressions of Brahman. They believe that we are all part of that cosmic force. They call it the ocean of souls. We all are a part of the ocean of souls. Every living thing is a part, plant, animal, and human. Many gods appear in masculine and feminine forms. Some of them appear as pairs and couples. And so the list goes on and on. They claim to be monotheistic because their supreme god is this cosmic force, this cosmic energy, Brahman, and yet Underneath that, there are these millions and millions of gods that they worship. They have several sacred writings. Uh, these writings are called the Vedas, or the Books of Knowledge. And they are the foremost sacred texts in Hinduism. They were written around 1200 BC to 100 AD, and they are the four Vedas. They expanded over time to include some other writings, uh, the Upanishads, the Aranyaka, these are commentaries and exposition on the four Vedas. So they believe the Vedas are, the, are inspired by the great Brahman, that they are the final rule of faith, and they contain hymns and poems and uh, liturgical material, directions for daily living, prayers. They explore the mysteries of Brahman, and so even the words are words that refer to vision and wisdom, and that's what's contained in the Vedas. Hinduism embraces many beliefs. For this reason, it's sometimes called a family of religions because there are these different groups of them. There are many different groups, and they have beliefs that are very um, different from each other. There is no official statement of beliefs in Hinduism. We're accustomed to our Christian, various Christian groups having a statement of faith. We, in the Assemblies of God, have what we call the fundamental truths, and it begins with that we're, we believe the Bible is the verbally inspired of God, and, and then it goes on to talk about there is one true God, and that uh, Jesus is God, the deity of Jesus. And so we have these core beliefs that we have been codified, have been written down, and we say, this is what we believe. Hinduism doesn't have a written down 
official statement of beliefs like that. They just believe that there's this nature of the universe and it has an impact on our lives. All living things, including people, are extensions of the Brahman. And the goal is that you would eventually lose yourself and become part of the great Brahman. And that is what you and I have heard of as nirvana. It is to extinguish oneself, to lose oneself, to become part, to merge with that great soul, that great ocean of souls. And so all people then, they believe, are trapped in a cycle of reincarnation so that you are constantly struggling to work your way to, nir to nirvana or nothingness. Life is a struggle. It is self-contained, self-motivated. You have to do it yourself. You have to work your way to where you're out of the struggle, and that's called liberation or moksha. Uh, so the goal in life is not to do well, not to have joy, not to know your God, but it's to end this awful struggle that you go through lifetime after lifetime. All souls, they believe, are struggling toward liberation. The struggle is to become perfect, to become divine, to eventually lose oneself. There's a law of cause and effect known as karma, where kind deeds beget kindness, bad deeds beget bad, and so depending on what you do in this lifetime kind of determines what you're going to do in the lifetime. They believe that when a person dies, you come back into this physical realm as maybe a person farther up the ladder toward nirvana or a person farther down the ladder away from nirvana. If you have done poorly, you may come back as an animal or a plant. You may have had previous lives as plant or animals. And so there are there are three ways that you can work towards salvation. Salvation is the goal, and that means breaking free of the reincarnation cycle. There are three ways they believe they can attain salvation. One of them is works. So if you do really well or really poorly in this lifetime, that determines where you are on the ladder. And so it's all up to you. You have to work your way to nirvana. Another way that you may be able to attain salvation is through knowledge or mysticism. These are the monks that go up into the mountains, and, and that becomes their life. And so that would be one way you could maybe attain salvation. The third way would be devotion to a specific god. You would choose one of these 33 million gods, and you would spend your life specifically being devoted to that god in hopes that that god then would kind of work out the details and get you out of this awful cycle of reincarnation and help you to reach nirvana. They worship in temples and other holy places, but primarily the worship of the Hindu takes place in the home. Every home, no matter how small, has a sacred split place to hold devotions with their families. And so most Hindus, for most Hindus, the emphasis is not so much on communal worship, going to a temple, worshiping together, although they do that. But primarily the worship in the home is where the emphasis is placed. You may remember having heard of the caste system in India that were classes of society, very rigid, um, unmovable, uh, unnegotiable classes of society. The caste system was actually a part of this religious faith. So uh, for thousands of years, there were these levels of castes with the Brahmins or the priests, the religious leaders at the top, and then going down through kings and warriors, down through craftsmen and tradesmen, and finally down at the bottom were the untouchables who didn't even have a caste. And they did the uh, uh, lowest 
chores that there were to do in a society. The only way a person could be become a member of a certain class or caste was by birth. In other words, you would hope that you would do well enough in this life that in the next life you would come back up the ladder a ways into a higher caste. And so they were not allowed to marry outside their caste. They were not allowed to go to school and get a better job and move up in society. Uh, life was strictly to obey the rules within your caste. Today, that isn't so much the case. India outlawed that back in the 30s. And so now you can go to school. You don't have to do the job that your family has always done. You can marry outside the caste. It is unlawful to enforce those restrictions today. However, as you know, long tradition is very difficult to overcome and to remove. And so in many places, it is still the case. Because all life is sacred, they believe that everything has a soul, all life, plant, animal, and people. And so they're reluctant to kill any living things. Many Hindus avoid eating meat, and many of them will not eat eggs. Beef is almost universally avoided uh, because the cow is considered a sacred animal. They don't worship the cow, they just believe that it is a sacred symbol of life. The cow gives much to mankind. It is a docile animal and it gives more to humans than it needs to take from them. There are also other animals that are considered uh, sacred. They are associated with specific gods, the monkey, the elephant, the tiger, and others. Many Hindus will tell you they believe in Jesus. They believe that Jesus was just one manifestation or avatar of the supreme God of the universe, Brahman. And so they do believe he came. They believe he was a God, a manifestation of Brahman. Hinduism is not a missionary religion. In other words, they're not seeking converts. They're not hoping you will join their religion. Uh, it is a, a religion for those who have been born into it by birth and heritage. And so in that way, they are not out there seeking converts. However, uh, it does attract others, Westerners, who are perhaps disillusioned with, unhappy with, um, not in favor of traditional religion as we know it in the West. And so the, uh, the peace, the, um, some attributes of it become, become attractive to Westerners. It has gained a foothold in the West. However, Hindus in America are generally more flexible, more inclusive. They will attend a temple that is shared by Hindus of other, of other persuasions uh, whose beliefs may be much different from theirs. And so uh, they're not so much to be so rigid about just one way of belief. When we share the gospel with those of the Hindu faith, we uh, must listen and get a feel, first of all, for what they believe. Because the beliefs are so diverse, because you cannot assume what a particular person believes when you hope to talk to them about the gospel, you must listen and kind of get a feel for what it is they do believe, because not everyone is the same. And so then, having done that, you need to let them know that Christianity offers a real and personal relationship with God. You know, their God is this great cosmic force, this ocean of souls, this energy. But we have a living, knowable, personal God. We have a relationship with him. 
And so that is something that would be entirely new to someone of the Hindu persuasion. And it's important to let them know that there is joy in knowing the Lord. There is lasting peace in knowing the Lord. John 3.16 says that God so loved us that he gave his son and he bestows upon us his grace and eternal life. And that is something that is just uh, so foreign to that Hindu, impersonal, struggling kind of life. God said he is the I am. Exodus 20 verse 2 says he is the creator of the universe. He is the one who is in control. He rules. And so this personal God that we know is the one who personally put the stars out there, who personally created each of us. And that would be something, once again, that would be new information uh, to a Hindu. A very important part that would be a good thing to share is that Jesus makes peace possible. They believe that life is a struggle. If I don't do well enough, I'm going to come back farther down the ladder. My salvation depends on me is what they believe, how well I do. And so there is no hope of help from the Lord where Jesus gives us peace. Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, Jesus said, Come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. I will give you rest. And so there is this peace that's possible in Jesus. There is relief from being stuck in that endless cycle of death and rebirth. And it's a good idea to use your own testimony, use your own story to tell them what it's like living for Jesus. Another thing is Hebrews 9, 27, 28 says, it is appointed unto man once to die. The Bible very clearly denies the concept of reincarnation. We are here for one lifetime. And then when we die, um, you know, we, then is the judgment. Then is the Lord decides we have done well, we're saved, we've, we've accepted Jesus as our Savior or not. And so there is this one lifetime for us, reincarnation absolutely denied in the Bible. Salvation is uh, obtained for us by Jesus' death on the cross and his resurrection. Good works, self-denial, there's nothing we can do other than to accept the gift of redemption that he has provided for us. And, and that's all we have to do. Our good works, uh, any, anything that we can do, the Bible says our righteousness is as filthy rags. Uh, a false deity cannot get you to heaven. It takes the gift of salvation from our Lord Jesus Christ. His death and resurrection paid the penalty for our sin. We don't have to do that in fearfully thinking we might come back as a, a, a lower life form and not yet make nirvana. If it is true that Thomas went to India and died there, I wonder what Thomas was saying to the Hindus because they were there then. If it wasn't Thomas, there's no doubt somebody went there very early as they began to evangelize the world. And think about what would they have said to these Hindus? Um, anchor your witness on the foundation of Jesus and what he did and how he died for us and, and provided salvation. The gospel the plain and simple gospel is still the power of God for the salvation of all people. Um, 1 Corinthians 1 says, The message of the cross is foolish to those who are headed for destruction. But we who are being saved know it is the very power of God. And so the power of the gospel alone is what we ask the Lord to use to penetrate the heart of someone who has not learned about him. We're going to look at Buddhism. Um, Buddhism is related to Hinduism in that it began as a reformation movement within Hinduism around 500 BC. 
there was a man born whose name was Siddhartha Gautama. He was born a Hindu in India. And it, again, to give you some perspective uh, with some history that's more familiar to us, this would have been about the time of Ezra and Nehemiah in the Old Testament, about the time Joel and Malachi were prophesying in Judah. Siddhartha was born into the ruler caste. He married a princess, and in his 20s, he became very disillusioned and unhappy with life, looking for the meaning of life. And so he went off by himself, and he practiced self-mortification or infliction of pain upon himself and came close to death. And he realized eventually that that was futile, and he developed what he called the principle of the middle path. So that aestheticism, this extreme spiritualism, this self-mutilation, that kind of devotion to spiritualism was futile. That didn't work. Nor was it good to have great indulgence in a fleshly sense you know, to completely throw out all spiritual concern. And so he says the path to, to a successful life is the middle path, a balance between extreme aestheticism and extreme indulgence. And so that was the beginning of his developing the religion of Buddhism. During a period of meditation one day, he sat under a fig tree, and he reached a state of enlightenment, he said, he claimed that he entered nirvana, in other words, this oneness with the universe, the cosmos, um, while still alive. And he was the only person to ever have done that. And so that then is how he claimed he became the Buddha. And that's the origin of Buddhism. He, the tree under which he sat was called the Tree of Wisdom. So for the next 45 years or so, he built a large core of disciples and taught them his precepts and his way. He died at 80 years old. And after his death, the religion still spread somewhat slowly, but several hundred years later, an emperor of India embraced this religion of Buddhism and was responsible then for its great spread throughout Asia. Their sacred writings are, for the most part, the th what they call the three baskets. Buddha himself left no written word. He taught orally. And so his ideas and traditions and philosophies were passed down by word of mouth. After he died, his disciples wrote down his teachings and his precepts and commentaries on those preaching, on those teachings and precepts. And those are what those three volumes, teachings, precepts, and commentaries, are called the three baskets. The idea of a basket being uh, the, re the receptacle for many ideas, many teachings, and so each volume has many teachings in it. They are diverse among large numbers of Buddhist Buddhists because many of the groups have then added to these writings. Siddhartha rejected the caste system. He threw that off, and he developed what he called the Four Noble Truths. So there are yet today these four noble truths that are kind of the foundation of Buddhism. They are very sorrowful and depressing. Truth number one, the truth of suffering. Here's truth number one you need to know if you're going to be a Buddhist. Life is full of pain and suffering. Truth number one. The next truth is the cause of suffering, that the cause of suffering is the desire or thirst for fleshly pleasure, for prosperity, the things of this world. And so that will, according to truth number two, cause you truth number one, which is pain and suffering. Truth number three, the truth of the end of suffering can be overcome. You can overcome the pain and suffering. That's truth number three. Truth number four is, the truth of the path that leads to the end of suffering. Truth number four 
is the eightfold path. So it is the way in which you overcome the pain and suffering of life. The eightfold path, eight precepts that you must follow in order to overcome pain. First one, the right view or knowledge of the Four Noble Truths. So first of all, you have to be aware, you have to acknowledge the Four Noble Truths, the pain and suffering. And then from there on, it's composed, it's a list of the way that you do overcome them. Right aspirations or intentions, the intentions of your heart have to be right. Right speech, which means no falsehood, always speaking the truth. Right conduct. There were certain things that he said uh, were forbidden. For example, killing and stealing and, and lying, etc. So that is a kind of a behavior one. Number five, right livelihood. The way in which you earned your living, certain occupations were forbidden. Uh, you couldn't be a slave trader, a tax collector, a butcher, a weapon seller, and other, th other things that would be similar to that. Number six, right effort or attaining a wholesome state in one's life. Right mindfulness or self-analysis, self-evaluation. And the last one is right meditation. So those eight, uh, eight parts of the, the path would help you to overcome the pain and suffering that he, uh, that he talked about in the Four Noble Truths. The first thing you kind of have to understand is that Buddhism is not so much a religion as a philosophical belief system. Um, life is full of sorrow. They believe all happiness is an illusion. All that's real is pain and sorrow. And you are deluded if you believe that you have some happiness. Uh, again, just like the Hindus, the goal of each Buddhist is to attain that state of nirvana where eventually you become nothing, loss of self. The light is extinguished, and you're part of the great cosmos. There's not really a god. There's not really a deity in Buddhism. Um, there are some groups who recognize Buddha as being a god, but he himself denied that. He said he was not deity. Um, the absolute is completely impersonal. Again, it's the Brahman, the, um, the cosmos. And so there's not really a God, and that's why we can say it's not technically a religion. It is uh, a group of philosophies, a way of life and beliefs. Even before this had spread to other countries and began to grow, it had divided into two main groups, one conservative and one liberal. The conservative uh, sect was called the Theravada, or the, another name for it, they call it the lesser vehicle. In other words, the vehicle to nirvana, it is the lesser one. The more liberal group of Buddhists is called the Mahayana, or the greater vehicle. This was mostly in northern India. And in some areas, they are so different that it's almost like two different religions. Theravada, the more conservative side, is concerned with insight and wisdom. It's kind of internal, uh, the mysticism, where the more liberal group is more about relationships with each other, how you treat other people, uh, feelings and compassion. Uh, Theravada, the, the lesser vehicle, teaches that each man is on his own. Salvation is reached only by self-effort. And again, the more liberal group will look at your relationships with others and how you treat other people. Theravada uh, centers on renunciation of the world and the monastic system. These are the monks that you see pictures of that go into the mountains that wear the yellow robes and devote themselves to mysticism. That's why it's called the lesser vehicle, because there aren't as many who can do that. There aren't as many who can hope to achieve nirvana in that way. Um, the more conservative group, the lesser vehicle, uses only the three baskets as their uh, sacred writings, where the more liberal, um, inclusive ones have added many other writings 
to their canon. There are many groups of them. Some of them you will have heard of. Pure Land Buddhism, you may have heard of. In Pure Land Buddhism, salvation is reached by chanting the name of Buddha. You probably have heard of Zen Buddhism. Um, it's much closer to the Theravada, the, um, the more conservative group. And they believe that salvation can be reached only through one's self. These are the ones looking for a supernatural experience, the mystics, uh, the ones who do a lot of meditation. Tibetan Buddhism, or Lamaism, in the country of Tibet is combined with the occult and magical religions of Tibet. The priests are called lamas, and I just wanted to mention this because you will recognize the head of the system is called the Dalai Lama, and he is worshipped as a reincarnation of Buddha. It is estimated that there are 470 million adherents to Buddhism, although that number is hard to pin down because there are many, many people who adopt the practices and the ideas, but don't really call themselves Buddhists. You know, you'll find people who do the meditations and other kinds of things that don't know anything about the theology and do not adhere to any of the theology. Um, these other Eastern religions are kind of easily adopted into Christianity if we're not careful. The principles seem appealing, compassionate, peaceful, and so people are interested in a mystical experience and not always aware of the other more ominous beliefs of the Buddhists. And another thing, it can kind of become embedded in a culture. For example, in Japan, Buddhism is so much a part of the culture that it, it affects everything from flower arranging to landscaping. So again, here, once again, you kind of get into a way of life more than a religion per se. Part of the appeal to Westerners is that nirvana can be reached without God. I'm on my own. I can do it. I can make my way to nirvana. Uh, it's by good works. I don't have to go to church. I don't have to follow these rules. I just have to do well in life. I just have to be a good person. And so that can appeal to some Westerners, particularly those who uh, are not happy with organized, institutionalized religions. Witnessing to a Buddhist uh, can be difficult. For one thing, if you say God loves them, that may mean nothing at all because for the most part, they don't have a God. There is no God. They don't believe in God. And so when you start out by saying God loves them, that may mean nothing to them. Here again, it would be a good idea to do as I suggested with a Hindu friend, and that would be, first of all, to find out what they do believe, because the beliefs are so widely diverse. Their understanding as, li as life being all suffering, all of life is pain and suffering, would perhaps make the idea of your telling them there is eternal life be not a good idea. That may sound terrifying to them. If life is all pain and happiness is all illusion, then why would I want to live eternally? And so there again, you kind of have to get a feel for where they're coming from, for what they really believe. It has often been effective to begin to witness to uh, people of the Buddhist persuasion by the use beginning in Proverbs and Ecclesiastes, some of the wisdom books, uh, Jesus teaching Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5 through 7, uh, those principles of, of life, that's the kind of idea that they're more used to hearing. And there again, once again, let the word of God do its work in their hearts. 
You know, you bring the scripture, you bring the gospel, and, and his word will not return void. We count on his word to do its work in their hearts. Um, many Buddhists may relate to the idea once again, similarly to the Hindus, uh, of Jesus being the person who will release them from the bondage of reincarnation, the captivity that comes with that idea that I have to keep struggling through these lifetimes to eventually become nothing. Uh, Jesus can take that away from them. He can liberate them from that. And so that is something that may be meaningful to a Buddhist. The issue of sin is a completely foreign idea to them. Uh, you know, there's good behavior and bad behavior, and the effect of that is how far I can make my way up or down the ladder. And so sin against God is not really a concept that they embrace, and therefore not really a need for a savior. And so uh, the idea of Jesus liberating them from that captivity is something that often will be effective. Again, look for common ground and build on it as much as possible. We never start out by saying, okay, here's a list of everything you have wrong. You start out with something that you have in common. Uh, your own testimony of Jesus and his victory over sin and death and what he does in your life daily, uh, what it's like to walk with the Lord is something that will be, that will be effective. That is the gospel. Once you've kind of laid that groundwork, then go back to those scriptures that I've given you, those ideas that I have given you that can be used for witnessing to someone who is of the Hindu faith, because in many ways they are similar as Buddhism came out of Hinduism many years ago. In conclusion, I just want to say again, as I am studying these different faiths time and again, I am just overwhelmed with gratefulness that I have been born here and someone shared the truth with me. I was taught the true gospel. I know that Jesus loves me and that I'm saved and that salvation is mine through his grace, through the gift of God, and so, you know, I'm just always, always reminded of that as I go through these studies. And I just want to add that, you know, we are mandated by Christ to share the gospel. He told us to go into all the world and preach the gospel. And just as a reminder, I want to um, reiterate that we here at New Stand and Assembly of God support more than 40 missionaries around the world. Some missionaries are to people groups within the United States, and others are across the world in many countries. And so our part is to be the sender. Uh, not each one of us is called and can go to somewhere like India or one of these other places where the people are in such darkness. But with our prayers and our giving, um, we have a robust missions program here. And so pray about what the Lord would have you to do in order to fulfill the commission that Jesus has given to every one of us. It is not just to the man or woman who is called to physically go. We all have a part in that effort. And so we are so grateful that we are here and we have the truth and we are able to do that. We are able to be participants. So thank you for being here. I am just so happy to be able to share this with you and I look forward to seeing you hopefully in person very soon. Let us pray before we go. Father, thank you once again for this time. I pray that you will just work these truths in our hearts. We pray that you will just give to each of us a burden and a compassion for those who don't know you so that we might be instruments in your kingdom that we can do the work that you have called each of us to do, whatever that is. Be with us again, we pray, for health and safety and well-being for our church family and for their families. In the name of Jesus, we ask it. Amen.